Hi everyone, welcome back to Lecture 8A of Useful Genetics. We're going to talk about experiments and sampling. We'll compare dealing with small and large numbers, we'll compare statistics and probability, we'll compare populations and samples, and we'll compare hypotheses and observations. And these comparisons will set the stage for the actual testing of an experimental hypothesis statistically, which we'll do in the next lecture. So here's a diagram of the sort of range of numbers that you've encountered already in genetics problems. And it runs the gamut from very simple problems that you would illustrate with a pedigree, where you're thinking about one child what would be the genotype or the phenotype of one child, runs all the way through families and organisms that have many offspring to situations where many replicate crosses have been done, such as Mendel did, to generate a large amount of data. Now, we've applied the same genetics analysis techniques to thinking about these different kinds of problems, starting with what are the parent genotypes, What are the genotypes of the gametes? What are the genotypes of the offspring? And then finally, what are the phenotypes of the offspring? But there are um, numerical techniques for evaluating how confident we can be of our answer that can't really be applied to problems where we're dealing with only a child or a family. In pedigree problems, we're largely restricted to situations where we can use simple logic to say, this is possible, this is not possible. In larger populations, we're often in the situation of saying, well, these are the numbers that we got. Are they consistent with our hypothesis or not? One way to clarify thinking about this is to think about the distinctions between statistics and probability. And I really like the way this diagram illustrates the two in the context of a pail full of marbles. So if you can't see into the pail of marbles, you might be able to reach in and pull out a handful of marbles. And what you would want to do is to say, Given the information that I have in my hand, what kinds of marbles I have in my hand, what can I say about the marbles that are in the bucket? That would be a statistical inference. On the other hand, if you knew the properties of the marbles in the bucket, the frequency of each color, you could use probability analysis to predict what might be in a small sample of the marbles that you pulled out with your hand. And in fact, the ability of statistics to predict from a sample the properties of the population derives from probability analysis that specifies what properties a sample would have given the properties of its population that it's derived from. So I'm going to go through two illustrations of this. The first, thinking about large populations whose properties we want to know. And the second, thinking about the results of genetic crosses. So imagine we have a large population that we want to know the properties of. Say the properties of all the Asian peoples in the world. We cannot afford to analyze everybody, the whole population, to find out their properties. Instead, we would analyze a small sample from the population. We would characterize the sample for whatever the property is that we're interested in, and then we'd use this observation on the sample to make inferences about the property of the whole population. For example, this is what was done in Lecture 6F. We referred to a stomach cancer study, a genome-wide association test study, showing the odds ratios of relating particular SNPs to the risk of stomach cancer. That study was done on a relatively small Han Chinese subpopulation, a sample, and then it was extended to all Asians. How valid that is depends on 
how large the sample was, and on other information we might have about the genetic properties of other Asian populations. A second way to think about this is in the context of experiments. So when we do a cross, we have a hypothesis of what we think the results should be. And we want to find out whether that conclusion is valid. In the previous lecture, we talked about a cross where we got a number that was, you know, not very close to the predicted number. We went back and tested another hypothesis. What we didn't do was a statistical test to tell us how close our numbers should have been to the expected result. We can think of this analysis in terms of a situ our hypothesis and our understanding of genetics principles tells us what we would expect to see if we did many replicate experiments or a very large experiment in a situation where our hypothesis was true. We can say if our hypothesis is true, if this phenotype is controlled by two alleles at one locus, then this is the result that we expect to see. But we can't afford to do all of these this many results to test our hypothesis. Instead, we take a sample population, maybe we do one cross, and we analyze the results, we get an observed result, and then we want to ask, is our observed result consistent with the result we would expect if our hypothesis was true and we had been able to do a very large number of experiments? And this inference is often problematic in genetics, and the next lecture is going to discuss statistical techniques and ways of thinking about the inference that let us give us rules and guidelines for deciding when an observed result is consistent with the result predicted by a hypothesis, and when the result is inconsistent and the hypothesis should be discarded. So what we've done is to clarify the problem. We've related sample properties to population properties and observed experimental results to expected results from a hypothesis or to the um, properties of a larger population. And coming up next, we're going to talk about how you can test whether the results of your small experiment are consistent with a particular hypothesis or not. I hope to see you there.